Hello, I'm Voice Print volunteer Donna Kakonge, and with me today is Bridget McDonough. Welcome to the Advice Show, Voice Print's weekly dose of advice columns. We begin with Bridget McDonough. From the April 15th edition of the Globe and Mail, here's an advice column written by Anthony E. Wolfe, titled, No, I Didn't Do What I Just Did. Teens have selective memories, but getting them to acknowledge it isn't always necessary. Sorry, Kayla. I'm just not comfortable with Stephen coming over when I'm out. Oh, my God! We're not going to do anything. We're going to study. You think that I'm sex-crazed, which I'm not. No, I am just not comfortable with the two of you here alone. The discussion continued downhill from there until Kayla threw a full-fledged hint from screaming at her mother, I hate you! I hate you! I hate this house! at which point Kayla stormed off to her room. Later that evening, Kayla, you were way out of line earlier when I said you couldn't have Stephen over. You can't behave that way. What way? Teens can be oblivious of their own behavior. Promises to take out the trash, five hours later it's not taken out, and no memories remain of any promises. They accidentally let the cat out, So how did the cat get out? I don't know. It wasn't me. It's as if it never happened. And even if they were somehow to see a replay, they wouldn't believe it. Kayla, I want you to watch this. It's a video of your tantrum earlier this evening. That's not me. That's some kind of trick video, like it was computer generated. Are they lying, or do they distort reality that easily? The answer is probably somewhere in between. The fact is that some teens, when dealing with their family and often other adults as well, appear to live in an altered state of consciousness, whereby anything that's unpleasant somehow gets screened out. They just don't seem to get it. So what to do? Here's one major mistake that parents often make. They choose to exert their energy in trying to get their child to own up to what actually transpired, to admit that they did throw a hissy fit or forget to take the trash out. The problem is that they very rarely meet with any kind of success, and I mean very, very rarely. Instead, they invariably get into a back-and-forth argument about what actually happened, which works against any positive outcome. Kayla, you had a major tantrum and were swearing at me because you couldn't have Stephen over. I didn't have a major tantrum. You always totally exaggerate everything I do. No, you were out of line. You were out of line. You were yelling at me. Unfortunately, the more that Kayla's mother focuses on getting Kayla to see or admit to what actually happened, the more Kayla becomes combative, defending her position and getting increasingly mad at her mother. The more defensive Kayla gets, the more she sees her mother as evil and the more she feels persecuted, rather than reflecting on what may or may not have been her behavior. We asked Kayla, what did you just learn about your behavior from your discussion with your mother? that my mother is a bitch. This is how she will see it. Far better is not to get caught up in trying to convince them of the reality or their cultability. Far better is to simply state the reality as you saw it and go on from there. Kayla, I did not like the way you acted earlier this evening. What way? You had a major tantrum when I said you couldn't have Stephen over. I did not. I did not have a tantrum. You're exaggerating. I do not want you acting that way in the future. What way? I wasn't acting any way. That is, Kayla's mother is stating her piece more or less oblivious to Kayla's denials and needs to say no more. Kayla will probably continue to argue, but she does hear her mother. She may or may not change her view of her own behavior, but there was no derailing argument, only a statement by her mother that Kayla has heard and has to address her in her own mind. Will she change her behavior in the future? Maybe, maybe not. But there is a far better chance of her reflecting on her own behavior, rather than seeing it as just another instance of her mother being overbearing. 
I mean, I don't take it back that she can be a bitch, but I do have some vague memory of me screaming at her and maybe, just possibly me using some swear words. It's all very dim. That was an advice column written by Anthony E. Wolfe, titled, No, I Didn't Do What I Just Did, from the April 15th edition of the Globe and Mail. Adriana Barton is the author of this article from the June 2nd edition of the Globe and Mail. The title is Advice to Married Couples Who Expect Children to Bring Joy. Advice to Married Couples Who Expect Children to Bring Joy. Stop at One Kid. One's enough, thank you. Having children is supposed to bring couples closer together, but a new study supports the notion that baby drives them apart, and many families call it quits at one. Adriana Barton, The Globe and Mail, Vancouver, Tuesday, June 2nd. Before they had a baby, Mel Yanke and her husband Mike were best friends, says Miss Yanke. They laughed a lot, did chores together, and coasted through five years of wedded bliss. Then came a bouncing baby boy, followed by sleepless nights, endless laundry, and Mike's retreat into what Ms. Yanke calls the man cave. Bickering ensued. The more I nagged, the less stuff got done, Ms. Yanke explains, adding that her husband's diagnosis with multiple sclerosis made matters worse. What little free time they had, the couple stopped spending together. It was really hard for both of us, says Ms. Yanke, who lives in a suburb of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Eventually, they got help with child care so they could reconnect emotionally. Now that their son Gabe is more than two years old, the couple is happier than ever, she says. But the Yankees have ruled out having a second child, which Ms. Yanke fears could injure their marriage beyond repair. I guess I'm not willing to take that risk, she says. Today's parents seem prepared to set aside all kinds of pleasures to nurture a child, from their sex lives to careers, not to mention happy hour beers. But there's one thing even the most kinder-friendly couple is loath to give up, their marriage. And when one child rocks the marital boat, a growing number of couples are sticking with just one to keep their union strong. That doesn't make them wimps, though. In fact, research suggests that children are more taxing on marriages than they used to be. In an eight-year survey of 218 couples, 90% reported a decline in marital satisfaction after the birth of the first child. The recently published study noted a spike in communication problems and a crisis of faith in the marriage, especially during the adjustment period after the birth. Some of the couples said their relationships were stronger post-birth, but the vast majority reported a general deterioration in their marriages over time that was more pronounced than for childless couples. For most parents, marital satisfaction doesn't rebound until after the last child has left home, according to Daniel Gilbert, a Harvard psychology professor who analyzed studies and made the conclusion in his 2006 book, Stumbling on Happiness. The problem may be partly a modern one, social scientists say. Couples are having children later, are more invested in their careers, and don't get as much help from extended family members as they did in the past. Given the fragile state of the modern marriage, it's no wonder only children are on the rise. In 1980, just 10% of American kids were onlys. Today, more than 20% of children are singletons, and the figure is closer to 30% in cities such as New York, based on data from Rutgers University. In Canada, one in four children is the only child living at home, according to the 2006 census, but the figure doesn't indicate whether the child has younger siblings on the way or a brother or sister who lives in a different household. 
parents end up with just one child for all kinds of reasons, including finances and fertility problems, says Carolyn White, editor of Only Child, an online magazine launched 12 years ago. Nevertheless, marital tension is high on the list. We get thousands of letters from all over the world, and this issue of having a child affecting the marriage is pretty common, she says. Some couples stop at one child as a preventative measure. Jen Arbo of New Westminster, B.C., remembers suffering emotionally during her parents' messy divorce when she was a child. As a new parent, Ms. Arbo says she's very protective of her decade-long relationship with her husband, Ross. The couple argued more after the birth of their son, Kale, now 10 months old, she says. Their marriage has bounced back since then, she says, and the couple is determined to keep it that way. Having another child would add stress to their lives, and you don't want to mess with a good thing. Adult children of divorce may be particularly sensitive to changes in the marital climate, says Robbie Wagner, a family therapist for 30 years and chief executive officer of the Calgary Counseling Centre. The risky times for people are generally in the first three years after a baby is born, Ms. Wagner says. Most people adjust to their new role as parents, she adds, but the time available for the couple decreases with each child. Having two is more than double one, Ms. Wagner says. Baby-induced marital stress can range from a brief cranky period to what some parents describe as a form of trauma. It was really sudden and quite destructive, says Petra, a mother who declined to give her real name to protect the privacy of her husband and four-year-old daughter. Both partners were even-tempered before their daughter was born, she says, but Petra began to snap after she developed type 1 diabetes during pregnancy and then coped with a child who didn't sleep through the night for two years. Petra's distress made her husband anxious, she says, so I stopped talking to him about things that would worry him. The couple drifted apart before they went into counseling four months ago, she says. Sometimes Petra dreams of having a second child, but her husband doesn't want another, she explains, and their marriage is still on shaky ground. I have to choose what's good for our daughter, too, and I think that having a good relationship with my husband is better for her. Other parents say they've made peace with the decision to have a one and only. Ms. Yanke is delighted to be a mother without the burden of caring for multiple children or the added strain on her marriage, she says. It gives me the best of both worlds. More kids, less happiness. Having more kids isn't merrier, according to research from the University of Pennsylvania. In a 2005 study of almost 35,000 adult identical twins in Denmark, sociology professor Hans Peter Kohler concluded that mothers with one child are about 20% happier than their childless siblings. But mothers with second or third children are less happy than mothers with only one child, the study found. A father's happiness increases after the birth of the first baby, however. Additional children have little effect on the father's mood. By studying identical twins, researchers were able to zero in on external causes for happiness and control for genetic predispositions, according to Dr. Kohler. His advice to married couples who expect children to bring joy, stop at one kid. That was an article by Adriana Barton from the June 2nd edition of the Globe and Mail. It was titled, Advice to Married Couples Who Expect Children to Bring Joy. You're listening to The Advice Show on Voice Print. This advice column, titled Ellie, is by Ellie Tesher from the March 28th edition of the Toronto Star. Second thoughts after a big breakup. My girlfriend of five years ended it last fall because I hadn't wanted to marry or have a child with her. We were both previously married. I have two boys. She has no children. 
Initially, I had attachments to ex-girlfriends, but she disapproved. I lost contact with them. They exploded back on the scene after our split when I joined Facebook. Three weeks ago, my girlfriend and I got back together, but those contacts broke our relationship again. Yet in those short weeks, I rediscovered how much I do love her. I was ready to commit to both marriage and having a child. I've tried repeatedly to email and text her. She said not to text her again. This breakup involved no cheating or alienation of affection. I want to fulfill her dreams, which have now turned into our dreams. How do I convince her? Changed man. Proceed slowly, sincerely, and with great sensitivity. To her, it likely seems you were gearing up for dating again, through those contacts with exes. Also, once apart, she would see more clearly that through five years together you wouldn't compromise on her dreams. Now, you'll have to reach out for her sake. Don't make it about you again, and about your own changed desires. Send a personal note, not email, about wanting to give her all that she wanted, then send flowers and ask to meet. It may take several tries, along with giving her time to believe you. Be prepared. Your long delay in appreciating her deep needs may have turned her off for a while, or even permanently. Several years ago, my husband caught me doing cocaine. I'm no addict and did it for fun sometimes. I promised I wouldn't touch it again and haven't. Too much to lose. Kids, marriage, self-respect, and my husband's respect. I own a business. My manager caught one of my employees with cocaine and sent her home. I went over to be with my manager until closing, and she handed the drug to me as I didn't want her to keep it on the premises. For the next few days, my husband wouldn't speak to me. He'd gone into my coat pocket, found a small packet of cocaine, and assumed it was mine, understandably. I tried to explain, but he didn't want to listen. I have cameras at work that show what happened, but he hasn't gone to look. I've taken a drug test, and I know it'll come back negative. I feel so angry that he won't listen and looks at me like I'm scum. How do I approach him with my drug test? I don't want to lose my family over a misunderstanding. You're not scum, but you're living with a husband who's rigid in his attitudes and principles. And I suspect that this applies in other areas as well. It's either irrational fear on your part or a cruel threat on his that anyone who's drug-free could lose their children due to long ago and sporadic drug use. Speak up with confidence when you've got the camera evidence and test results in hand. Apologize again for the past, but insist it's not been part of your life for years and has no place in the present. If he continues to treat you negatively, there are bigger problems at hand, and the cocaine incident is just an excuse. Get to counseling together, and or get legal advice for yourself. Continuing with advice from Ellie, look at role you play in bad breakups. I met a woman at church who, unfortunately, had been attacked one month before we met. I wanted to get her and her daughter, age two, out of the place where it happened, and move them in with me a month after we dated. I treated her daughter like my own. I also have my own daughter on weekends. Then this woman had surgery, and I had to do everything: bathing everyone, cooking, cleaning. I got a response from her that it's not a big deal. I work all day and then come home and take care of everyone. And now she's gone to her family's house, making me look like the bad guy. I feel unappreciated big time, and I think it's over between us. I bought her a ring, and we were going to get married this year. I feel guilty about the little girl with no father in her life. I've been in bad relationships before, and think being single might be the best thing for me. I've been thinking about getting counseling. What do you suggest? Unappreciated. You're a good man, who may have hit a sensitive nerve with this woman when she was most vulnerable. She likely felt you resented her presence. 
If you feel this relationship followed a pattern of other bad endings, then counseling would be wise. It will help you better understand your own reactions and help you with future relationships, even with your own daughter. As for the other child, your responsibility only extends as far as her mother wants it to. If she's moved on, her child is probably young enough not to feel you abandoned her. If you think otherwise, sending birthday and holiday cards would be appropriate unless her mother asks you to stop. My husband of 18 years has always enabled his daughter, 38, to live beyond her means. She expects her dad, ultimately me, since he's retired, to constantly bail her out. Last year, behind my back, she hit him for a $2,000 loan for dental work. He crossed the line and borrowed from my mother, 83. I hit the roof. He's on a fixed income, and I'm only employed for 10 months yearly. His daughter works, has manicures, and smokes. I can no longer trust my husband to honor our commitment to each other. A year later, my mother hasn't been paid back, which has strained my relationship with her. Worse, my husband started repaying my mother without consulting me from our joint account. So my husband and I agreed he'd stop giving his daughter any money until she'd repaid my mom and him. Last night, I overheard her asking again for money. He arranged immediately to meet her and help. I stepped into the conversation and said no. Another huge fight with my husband took place. Money has been the relationship ever since I came on the scene 20 years ago. I'm ready to walk out the door. Wit's end. Give your marriage a final chance and let your husband know it. Separate your bank accounts and let him deal with his daughter out of his own pocket. Be firm that you will not bail him out. Remember your own part. You put up with this for years. But now, the father-daughter dysfunction is affecting your limited joint income. He's done his daughter a disservice by not insisting long ago that she get credit counseling and or face the consequences of her overspending. This is the Advice Show on VoicePrint. I'm your volunteer reader, Bridget McDonough, with Donna Kakange. Keep on VoicePrint for the Arts and Entertainment Report coming up next. Continuing with more of Ellie, boyfriend jokes about future together. After more than three years together, whenever people ask when we're getting married, my boyfriend responds jokingly and laughs it off, like saying never or if she's good. When we've discussed marriage and children, he says when the day comes, it'll happen, or if everything goes well. I've tried explaining how his response makes me feel he's not committed to our relationship or he's ashamed. He says if we talk about how happy we'll be when marriage and kids do occur, we won't be as happy when it happens. I now quickly answer the same way he does when people ask, hoping he can see how it feels to be in my shoes, but it isn't working. How can I get him to answer those questions differently, such as one day, like it's going to happen? Awkward. It's your insecurity that's letting him get away with thoughtless behavior. You've been together long enough to have a real conversation. If he's still uncommitted or actually ashamed, leave him. If he's uncertain, find out why. Standing awkwardly beside him as he puts down the idea of your future together, even jokingly, is the same as accepting a public insult. You don't have to be public about your plans, but you do have to have a private understanding, which you've arrived at together. Then you can laugh with him when he brushes off inquisitive folks. Stop copying his silly responses and get him to be open with you about the long term. Is he in or out, or waiting for something more certain to come along? My stepson, 25, has a decent entry-level job in his field, but he periodically threatens to quit, go back to school, travel the world, etc. It drives me crazy that he has no clue about the effect of the economy on us and expects we'll help fund him, worried. He has a right to change course and to dream. You have a right to say no to what you cannot afford. 
My wife's seeing a psychologist because while she believes that I've been a good, caring, and devoted husband father for more than 27 years, she wants to understand her lack of intimate feelings toward me. She agrees with me that I should also see the psychologist because I also want to understand and learn whatever behavior of mine has led to her problem, as I'm sure I must be at least partly the cause. However, this psychologist suggests I see a separate professional, whereas I thought she'd like to see the whole picture. A different person seeing me alone cannot truly understand my wife just through my unintentionally biased opinion. So should I insist on seeing her or go to another psychologist? Puzzled. It's not unusual for a psychologist to insist on not counseling both partners. Your wife didn't seek marital therapy. She's exploring her own personal dilemma, which seems to be a disturbing confusion between logic and experience versus her conflicting emotions. It's a private journey until she's at a comfortable point of self-understanding and can share with you what she's learned about herself. Her psychologist has decided that you should go through a similar process on your own before you two try to work on your intimate relationship. As you say yourself, it's not only about your wife, but about your behavior too. Accept the professional's guidance. This advice column, titled Ellie, is by Ellie Tresher from the March 28th edition of the Toronto Star. You've been listening to the Advice Show on Voice Print. The studio producer for this program was Tony King. For Bridget McDonough, I'm volunteer reader Donna Kakonge. Thank you for listening to Voice Print.